Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Clark Morris. I'm the director of the Harem and Jewel series. And how lucky are we, right? Uh, this has been an incredible evening. Wow, I told uh, Joyce and Yannick backstage, I hardly know what to say. I'm so blown away by uh, what we just witnessed. Uh, a phenomenal and uh, premiere of a musical evening um, here in Kansas City. So I, um, we're gonna take a few moments to have some of your questions, but before we begin, um, I just wanna know uh, a little bit more about the genesis of how this came together. Um, uh, how did we arrive at tonight? May I start? Um, three, if not four years ago, I don't know if you remember this because we didn't talk about this so much, but through our common management came the request. <laughs> Joyce Di Donato would like to do recitals with you. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. And as you know, uh, piano is not my day job. So I was at first a little, ho, 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 uh, ho, ho, <laughs> ho, oh, ho, oh. but mostly ho. Oh. I felt I, I had, how to say, I had no choice. I just thought this is too, I felt honored. And we had worked together, but we worked together more since then. So this is the visionary Joyce thinking we should be together. There was no repertoire involved. There were just days where we could align our agendas, which is, was three years or four years later, which is now. So this period was in my calendar for a long time. And then maybe you can tell the rest of the journey <laughs> where I threw you a curveball. Okay, so I have to back up for one second and say, um, okay. uh, first of all, who wouldn't want to do a recital with you? I think I just got lucky. But number two, welcome to Kansas City for the second time. Yay! I could get used to this. Yeah. If I had a we key to the city, I'd give it to you, but I don't have one. <laughs> Not that I'm bitter, but um, we, my father used to come to this series. I've probably told this story a few times. And if I could imagine his uh, joy in experiencing a night like tonight, having the music director of the Philadelphia Orchestra and the new music director of the Metropolitan National Opera and one of the greatest human beings around here. He wouldn't believe it. Uh, so fast forward, uh, we were recording Clemenza di Tito in Baden-Baden about a year and a half ago and it was the time to sit down and really talk repertoire because presenters were getting nervous going, do we have composers yet? Do you have any repertoire? And both of our agents were like, we need a list. So I arrived with a list thinking, let's do a mixture of piano that works for orchestra too, and we can then have a program to choose all things. And you said, I have another idea. Vinteriza. And this is, um, in all honesty, I've done recitals all throughout my career, and I love them, but this is a piece that never crossed my mind. It was too much of a holy grail and too sacred in a way. Um, but you, you convinced me, you said this is the doorway to Mahler. And also, if we're gonna do recitals together, why don't we do a recital together and bring the greatest song cycle written um, to the places that we have the honor of, of doing this. And as luck would have it, um, and I just told you this backstage, Clark, the joy and the, the gift of debuting this here together in Kansas City is incredible because it's very daunting and it's, um, it's a scary thing as artists to tackle something like this. And so to, to do it in front of such a safe and, and attentive and um, receptive loving. audience is... Loving. I, and loving. I could feel the love. <laughs> I could feel the love, of course, for her, but thank you for including me in the family. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, so Kansas City lovers, what questions do you have? Back here? So the question is uh, a quote from the program, so naturally I dove in. What does it mean to dive into a new piece, a new work? The score comes out, the highlighter comes out, I sit at the piano and I go and I go and I go and I, I immerse myself in it. Um, in, some singers will do a lot of listening and I purposefully didn't listen much at the start of, of this. I didn't want um, any sound in my ear that I would be tempted to imitate. I wanted to really find it um, directly from Schubert. So I sat at the piano and I went. And what I have found with this piece is that it, it sort of possesses you. It, and you actually said this at the beginning. You said you have to have a very personal connection to this and you have to feel a deep connection so that you can deliver it. And, and it does, it grabs you and, and um, pulls you in. What does it mean for you? No, you, I had the, 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 the chance, the, the privilege of, of doing this piece with a good friend of mine, he was, uh, his name is Alex Dobson, he's a baritone, he's Canadian. So back in my youth, I, we did a few recitals around in Quebec, in Montreal, in Ottawa, and that was it. So I had this, this is why also I suggested it to Joyce, because I already had my connection with it, but of course, I'm talking, this was probably 15, 18 years ago, so, I, I had to reinvent it, and these days, if I don't have projects like those, um, as much as I love my instrument, the piano, it sits there in my apartment unplayed. And I have to, when I have these projects, then I go, and I have, for me, diving in means getting back in shape, or sort of a shape. Um, and, this time, working with Joyce and diving in with Joyce meant being in flip-flops in the middle of July. Um, uh, I was wearing a tank top. It was so hot, I remember. You look good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, but that's completely destroying my argument now. <laughs> But it was as far removed from winter, but yet I remember we spent four hours on 12 songs, taking each song and word by word, I would say, almost note by note, trying to invent it for us. And then I think it was ideal. Then we weren't a month apart doing separately, then back together at the end of August, still in very nice weather. And, and that was a bit disconcerting to be in sunshine and yeah. blue skies and, you know, it's light until 10.30 at night and we're in this Vintage. But today felt appropriate. Absolutely. Yeah, today <laughs> felt like we were in the right mood. Uh, just to elaborate just a little bit. So we worked very carefully in two sessions through each song and in particular with this uh, context that I wanted to see if it would work. And I said to Yannick, this idea that she is reading the journal of the man, I said, I want to go through each song and make sure we are not imposing anything and not forcing it. And if, it, if we had run against a, into a roadblock, we would have changed direction. And then I spent a lot of time, I was in Vienna this fall, and I spent a lot of time uh, with a language coach. I speak Italian and French, but the German is nicht gut. I don't, I don't speak German quite so well, and, and this is a thing that you have, you must have total command of the language, so but, I spent a lot of time. But now, after Winterreiser, you're fluent. Uh, oui, right? yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Genau. <laughs> right here, in the center. <laughs> so is there anything written in the book? Yeah, absolutely. That is, it's, it's, I wrote it as if it was his... His writing, because I wanted it to look down and, and see the words, and, and I found it very powerful to write the text and write the text. Um, so it's written that way. There's a yeah, it's handwritten, uh, I can testify. And it's, it's beautiful. It has, 
It really does look like a journal. I have and little sketches for each title. Yeah. <laughs> like a Lindenbaum tree. Oh, <laughs> oh I didn't see that There's one. There's the this water. Is... <laughs> There's the river, icy river, yeah. And I, I plan, I think each time I do it, I want to write it new, I think, as I go. Are you over here? Yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, several comments about uh, <laughs> your attire, how appropriate that was, but, uh, but particularly the last song, the organ grinder uh, moment, and, and how, um, uh, how chilling that was. And so just give us a little bit about um, how you set that scene for us. Did somebody here tweet that they were hoping I'd wear the drama queen dress tonight? <laughs> I saw a tweet about that. Um, no, it's, you know, I'm a real believer in that the visuals play a lot into helping the audience come on the journey. And so it needed to still be a little fashion, but, you know, somber and, and in the mood and maybe a little bit old, old fashioned in a, in a way. So thank you. Um, interestingly enough, when we were working through the songs in this context, the only one that didn't really fit was the organ grinder, La Yaman, at the end. Well, also, if I'm just an aside for, for, not an aside, but to complete this, I think it is the most difficult song in any approach to the cycle, even if you don't have this point of view of her um, reading the journal. It just musically is so enigmatic and um, to set the right pause, this said this kind of eternity, but yes, then... Because a lot, there's a lot of discussion about who is the organ grinder. Yeah. In a traditional setting, is it he looking at himself, he's already on the other side, and he's confronting his self? Is it the angel of death? Is it the grim rip, reaper? Grim reaper? You know, there's a lot of mystery, and it's, the, as you say, the most enigmatic. It's the one that leaves people sort of and it's a very strange way to end a cycle because it almost doesn't end, like going into oblivion. And as we were working on it, it's the one that I, it just, every other song, we found layers and layers in this approach, but that one felt strange. And it was in Barcelona. Yes. And we were working through it. We were trying to go fast because dinner was waiting. <laughs> let's get this song is so long let's go and uh and i went oh and i got chills yeah. which is always the sign and i went the journal ends with the previous song and Lyoman is her she's gone so far along with him on this journey she's probably been reading this for years and years and years and she always puts it down after but this time she's had enough and so the question is, what does she do? And, the, and it's the last line that, that kills me when she says, will you play my song? Because in, in her life, she's had to be obedient and do all these things and lose the man she loved. And nobody, she's never been able to have her voice heard. And so it ends with that question and there's no answer. It just... So I'm, I'm so happy to hear that was your, your reaction. Thank you. you over here. So uh, the question is about um, creating this uh, feminist narrative um, uh, when, when it's so, for so long, for such uh, a long part of history, this has been done from the male perspective. And um, so what's that like? What does it feel like, Joyce? Well, hi, feminist mom. <laughs> Very happy to meet you. <laughs> Was it KCUR? I love the radio here. Yeah. Um, see, this is, I think, actually, I think you should talk about this, too, because it changes your role at the piano. Well, I mean, to, to start with, there is an association with these songs because the poet was male and then because the composer was male, then it was associated by being male singers. But talk about how history changes perceptions. It's generally speaking baritones and basses that do this. 
Well, the original keys are all for tenors to begin with. So, and mo many, uh, half of the keys at least, we chose were the high keys, the original ones. So therefore, where Joyce was a soprano. So I'm just saying this is way less important than actually the gender discussion, but also just saying how sometimes we just, because Dietrich fischer dieskau did it and everybody thinks it's a baritone, you know, basically. And actually, it's not true. So that was starting with this. I mean, my role, hmm. But that came after. I think my role in this became that I, I don't know if you got my role at the piano. I might be curious to ask. Okay, I set the pace, yes. But then, if you think about the story, who am I in the story? Hmm? Well, one can say that. <laughs> yeah, her lover. Well, this is... Way to go, niece. <laughs> That's my niece. I didn't oh, tell her, I didn't tell her. Oh, <laughs> great. So I became the one having the, the, uh, written the, the journal and it's sort of the narrator, but it's then it becomes a little terrible because sometimes I just, I felt cruel in a way of having written this. And maybe that also, we can extend how when you say you've never had the voice, this is not you, but I mean the, the journal. And I think with the discussion that's happening in the world at the moment, this is I think what gets me personally the most. It's that last phrase and the fact that I'm put in a position now of just reading and witnessing what, as a man, my actions have as a consequence. Um, this is very much the state of mind which I find very difficult to go through and yet so necessary and enriching. But now you should speak about you. Well, it's, it's so interesting because um, this is our first time doing it. And, and you can't know this journey. We, we've done it in private, but it changes inexorably in, when you're in front of people. And so this is my first journey with it, ours together. Um, I, I, I do want to say it wasn't my intention to make this a feminist thing. It comes back to when Yannick was saying, you have to find your own way into this piece. And I couldn't. And the thing that kept sticking with me was, yeah, but, but what about her? <laughs> because in, if you read about this in, in articles that have been written, literally she gets a sentence and says, well, we don't know much about her. Case closed. And I was like, yeah, but, but, but. Um, she loved him, <laughs> and he's gone, or he's dead, and what did she do then? What is her life like? Where does she go? How does she get out of bed in the morning? Because chances are in that time, she wasn't able to grieve him. She was probably already married with a couple kids, or in that track, and so she couldn't grieve him. She has to do this in private. Uh, she has to shut off a whole part of herself in order to, to live with this. As we were going through, there's these huge expressions of emotion in the songs, and then all of a sudden the play out becomes very cold. And as we were going through it, it was like, oh my gosh, if we take the supposition that he wrote a journal, sent it in the post, she got it, it's a little bit like a suicide note, and it's a little bit like now do you know how I feel? So all of these playouts become quite passive aggressive, a little violent, until he goes further and further on his journey, he's going further from her. She's feeling the love and the, I felt it tonight, this is different before, this, this whole sorrow for him. The only place he could find a rest was in this coal miner's cabin. You know, there's the horror of what he went through. And so the, the music, the ghost, the spirit, 
takes on something more ephemeral as it goes on. So it, it really becomes a parallel journey between the man's words and the man's emotions and then my parallel experience with it. Okay, yeah, let's go upstairs. So the question is about uh, uh, suicide in um, uh, song literature and also in, in opera and um, um, romanticizing that um, as we see in some stories and our current modern sensibility about um, how we feel about suicide today and does that change your interpretation as you go back to these um, these old texts I I I understand what you're saying about romanticized but it doesn't I think the means the way I see it personally is not so much that the perspective has changed um, I don't think the intent was to make it beautiful, at least not in Werther, not... I mean, it's interesting you first talk about Charlotte because that's something we talked about a lot. Um, I... Mm, okay, I'm gonna answer very personally. Suicide is something that v touches me very, 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 very deeply. Uh, and we had this conversation right at the beginning. Um, I find it um, personally so, uh, something so sad for many reasons because it's the, the, the fact that sometimes you, someone is just next to you and you don't, as a human being, listen or hear the cry for help. Um, there's the sorrow, there's basically just this um, absence of for love of the life and people around um, not relating somehow and I mean there's so many of course things I don't want to oversimplify but and I I think that using this kind of piece and of text and of music to I wouldn't say overcome, but try to have as much empathy and as much um, understanding for what a person goes through. This is my personal angle with this. And uh, when I do Werther next year, which will be the first time, I'm, I'm sure that's gonna be this, a similar perspective. I don't know from your point of view. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting question, and it, you have to straddle a line between not reinventing something. I mean, the interpretation, especially in Massenet, is there's no room for discussion. <laughs> He's marked everything. So what, what I can't pretend doesn't exist is the 150 years of life and world history and, and discovery that has happened since these things were written. Um, the one thing I want to say about you, what you say is the, the searing, poignant beauty of something like this final journey in life, which in all likelihood, you, this is, it, the presumed thing is that this was a suicide. Um, there is a need, um, I think, for great artists to build connection and to give that, per I mean, the Einsamkeit in here, the loneliness where the hope leaves and, and all you want to do is just go into the earth. If you can hear that song and it goes straight into the core of your being because it is so beautiful, you you cannot, you can no longer say with confidence that you're alone because somebody else on this earth has understood. Schubert was months away from dying when he finished this cycle and he knew. And the poet had some access to that and the performers who have done this over centuries also have some access to that. And I think the gift and the necessity of putting these things out is you cannot 
it takes away your permission of making the assumption that you're alone because you're not. You're, and that person is not the only one that has ever lived this. Many have and many have taken the same journey and different journeys and art is the, the chance to open up that chest and go, oh God, okay, I thought I was the only one. And then there's comfort in knowing that, that you were not. So I don't know that my interpretation is different, but I have a deeper understanding, I think, about the modern world and suicide, and so I bring that to the breath as I, I sing it, and then let it hit whoever it needs to hit. Yeah. Beautifully said. Okay, we're gonna have to do just one more question, so we'll go here, yes. So did you work with an acting coach or a stage director? How do we get all this drama on stage tonight? This drama. You know, this is so interesting because, um, <laughs> I don't know if you knew the week that this man had last week. Tuesday night, he debuted as the, me the music director of the Metropolitan Opera with a new production of La Traviata. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of you are coming to see it in HD on Saturday. HD, live in HD, Jerry, yep. Um, he's gonna be the one doing this in the pit. And then he drives down to Philadelphia and he does three performances of the Messiah with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Meanwhile, Joyce appears on Saturday afternoon before the Saturday night. We decide, let's run through Winterreise. He says, sure, no problem. And then I say, I have another idea. On Monday, your day off, uh, <laughs> Why don't we run through Winterreise one more time? And we, we rented a room at Carnegie Hall and we invited just a really small group of, of people to join us because both of us felt it was really important to not come to you completely um, without anything. And, and we wanted to just see what it felt like putting it you up on You still got the premiere, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. But it was, there was a pre-premiere. <laughs> Um, but I, I invited one of my dear friends who happens to be a stage director, Leonard Folia. He um, directed me in Dead Man Walking, City Opera and other places. And he didn't know the piece at all, not at all. He'd never heard of it. And I sent him a bit of reading material, but he didn't listen to it. So here's this like New York Broadway director. And I'm, I'm, I'm picking up the book going, oh God, is he gonna get this, you know? And we talked a lot afterwards, and he was completely engrossed by it. And halfway through, he goes, "Ah, oh, I got Yannick's The Lover. Ah, and he, so he loved it. He made one suggestion, and he said, when you start it and the lights come down, have a light come up on the journal first. And Simon, our lovely lighting guy here, worked a miracle and just did, because, you know, he had an eye. This isn't something that needs a lot of staging, but just a little bit of context to, to help. So all of this, very sweet of Joyce to say the only thing that she had an advice on. And it's true, but yes, I can confirm, this is completely her, completely her. It's my day job, it's what I do. So uh, you have given us a tremendous gift. We will remember this forever. Seriously, this has been an incredible uh, artistic and musical evening. And I can't imagine a more sensitive lover actually coming from this piano. And uh, it, was, it really, truly was uh, amazing. Really, um, and we're so honored to present it here and to debut it here in Kansas City. And uh, we look forward to the next recital with Yannick and Joyce here in Kansas City. We so will never you forget this so much. Let's express no, our appreciation. Yeah. <laughs>